Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Neil Vernon. He's the Chief Product and Innovation Officer at Gresham Tech. Neil, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I think what you guys are doing at Gresham Tech is actually really innovative and cool, but maybe before we get into all that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Yeah, I know I'm going to start off with one of my favorite um, British American jokes. Uh, I know that humor doesn't cross the Atlantic very well, but let, <laughs> let's try it. So um, I'm from one of the Hamptons, actually, one of the original Hamptons, uh, a place called Wolverhampton, which... Okay, um, very cool. <laughs> you don't know Wolverhampton, but it, <laughs> I, I think Cornwall is one of the least um, correct. <laughs> it's, it's, it's at the centre, or it was at the centre of the Industrial Revolution. So yeah, but well, that's cool hole. in itself, no? It, it, it is cool in itself, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm very proud of, 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 of that background and that town. Um, and it's certainly where I, where I, where I grew up and, um, you know, I, I, as I say, I'm very proud of it. Very cool. So you went to university. What did you take and why? Yeah, and actually, let, let's go back to Wolverhampton just a little bit. Okay, um, sure. So you may, you, you're probably old enough to remember Tandy. You know, yeah. Um, and Tandy, uh, in its first venture across the Atlantic to the UK, actually set up its UK headquarters in Wolverhampton. Oh, interesting. And as a gift to every school in the in the in the borough, they gave an old um, I think it was called a TRS eighty, the you know one of the original Tandy computers, micro PCs, yeah. uh, basic built into it. And I remember this computer arrived when I was about fifteen or so, and it sat in the corner of a classroom, honestly, for about a year with nobody doing anything with it at all. And and I, one one day. I had a little bit of spare time, and I and I, and I, I powered it on, and, and they provided a manual, and, and I read the manual, and, and and I thought this looks a little bit interesting actually, um, and I and I I did a little bit of programming. Uh, it, it was basic, and it really, basic awesome. in, in in every sense of the word. Um, <laughs> but I I became over the next kind of weeks and months. The local, the only actually person in in the in the school, a school of like sixteen hundred pupils and three three hundred odd staff, um, the only person that um, really knew how to use this computer, and, and I started to you know use it for various things. I remember um, doing some of my physics, uh, my my A level, my uh, the next level qualifications in the in the UK A levels. I remember doing some of my A level work on on that and and um, impressing the impressing the teachers, actually impressing myself that I could actually get stuff done on a computer. Um, which actually led to me choosing computing as as my degree subject. So I went to Manchester and did a degree in computing and, and indeed my entire career has been spent um, connected with technology and, and, uh, and programming in general. Very cool. I, I know I, it's interesting because I've been in tech a long time and I'm like 40 now and I started like my all the immediate males in my family have been in tech since the 70s. So like I had a computer throughout the 80s and, you know, we were the first one of the first people to get Internet. And it was just it, it's interesting because I almost feel bad for people now getting into it because it's so many layers now and it's so complicated. And if you don't understand some of the basics, I, I find sometimes it can be really, really challenging. Do you agree with that? No. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Okay. Why? Because I imagine there was some guy in Tandy in the early 1980s that, that was saying things like, I remember when I had to solder resistors onto a circuit board and do this and do okay. that. There's, there's so many interesting. There's so many layers that that, that I had to learn, and, and 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 I feel sorry for for that guy in Wolverhampton that, that's having to learn about all of these different things. And I think you know we we get to 
ultimately we get to various layers of of, of abstraction, and and those layers of abstraction keep it simple for us. So I, I don't I I. I don't know that I do feel sorry. I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, I mean, obviously it's changed a lot. It's changed absolutely enormously. The level, the layer of abstraction we're dealing with is so, so different now. Sure. Um, keep sorry, going. I think sorry. I lost. Um, no, keep going. But uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't feel sorry. I, I, I do, I do end up having interesting conversations with my own children where I start to explain things about what's actually going on under the covers with the programming language. And then I realize, right. you know, do they really need to know this? They, they, they don't because the language, the computer is taking, you know, taking account of that level of abstraction, that, that level of detail that they, they no longer need to know about. So, uh, no, I, I don't, I don't feel sorry. I, I, I'd love to be starting out again, actually. I think the, the you know, the, the power of the modern computer that we're going to, I know we're going to talk later about AI, but the power of AI, I think there's so many, I, I, I'd love to be at the, the, the outset of my career at, the, at this point. I think there's just so, so many interesting things happening. Very cool. Okay. So walk us through your career and then let's dive into um, Grisham Technologies and how you uh, ended up coming there. Yeah, sure. So um, I left Manchester and uh, came to London. Okay. And I joined a, I joined a company called Logica, who were um, one of the leading UK software houses at that time. And they took on uh, largely um, big infrastructure projects. And actually, my, my first project, and it's one that I am very proud of, is um, I actually worked on the Channel Tunnel. Oh, cool. And I, and the particular, I, I was I was seconded to the architects for the tunnel and, and the, the architects that were building the UK end of the of the tunnel at, at Folkestone. And the particular challenge they had was wanting to know how big to build the car park and how many platforms should they build. And if people spent an hour in the duty free shop versus half an hour, what would that do to the to the, the the size of the car park? And if the trains were running late, would the car park overflow? And would it would it spill over into the freeway into the motorway that runs down to Folkestone? So I I, I built for them a simulation in Fortran of the of the Channel Tunnel and, and modelled how the car parks essentially and the, how the platforms would operate. Uh, under various uh, various scenarios, and of course, you know, on the one hand, they wanted to build as minimal amount of infrastructure as possible, but on the other hand, they knew that ultimately they might get fined if the car parks were too small and the freeways were all backed up because the people couldn't couldn't park their cars waiting to get onto a train. So it was a really interesting challenge and, and one that I, that I enjoyed immensely. And uh, it was my first foray. In fact, it, it's been the only foray in my entire career into the Fortran programming language which is which at the time was a really interesting language sure I, yeah well and i think it, it still can be in demand for certain kind of legacy systems right so people still do use it it's rare probably but i've heard of some people using it still <laughs> i think you said that you <laughs> like COBOL, where yeah. the, the mythical COBOL programmer can earn a fortune in in, in, in a day given that it, yeah. it, it, it's bizarrely still used yeah there's like you know there's less than a handful of people and there's fingers left over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fair anyway, let's just move on with my career. So I, I worked on a number of different, uh, actually all transport related projects. So okay. I, I, I did the ticketing. Uh, I, I was a, a minor member in a team that did the first electronic ticketing for the London Underground. I did those uh, dot matrix displays that tell you when the next train is going to arrive and, the, and worked, on, worked on that for the London Underground. Um, but of course, when you're in London, uh, there's a there's a financial draw to the city of London, and the city of London, as always, is uh, demands technologists. There's a huge uh, need for technology in the city, and two after two years of my career doing transport related stuff, I was persuaded. Um, and I'll be honest, I was persuaded by the money. Um, <laughs> to good reason. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there was interesting work as well, but I was, I was persuaded actually to to join Warburg, so uh, the, the, one of the one of the older UK in, investment banks at the time. So I joined Warburg, and um, I got involved in something that's been a problem throughout my whole career, really, which is 
how does the bank make sure that its reference data, its static data, is is correct? And how do they how did how do they build the right infrastructure for their for their reference data? At the time, I I couldn't spell static data. I had no idea what it was. All I knew was that they that they decided to build a, a repository of their customers and a repository of the instruments that they were trading. And I helped them build build a, 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 a database. And, and that was a two-year project, um, which now you wouldn't do. I mean, now there are vendors in the space. That's a problem that w- did exist, still exists, but the vendors correctly identified that the way Wahlberg do things compared to the way that... JP Morgan do things compared to the way that Morgan Stanley, compared to the way that Goldman Sachs do it. They all do it more or less the same way. And that was an area that was really ripe for commoditization and has been commoditized. And these days you, 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 you'd you buy an off, off the shelf solution. But at that time, there were no vendors in that, in that space. At least I don't believe there were. And uh, we had to build our own. We had to roll our own. So we were at a, you know, going back to that earlier point, we were at a low level of abst- abstraction at that point. But I helped Wahlberg build their first reference data system. And then um, I moved into an area of the bank around um, the management of the banks, bank accounts with other banks. And uh, m- many people are unaware, but banks do actually tr- uh, operate bank accounts with other banks. So, so at the time, Warburg, uh, Warburg's US dollar account was with Chase Manhattan in New York. And we were, we were challenged with a problem around the balance of that account either being too long, too, too much in credit, and Chase were offering zero interest, as you'd expect. You know, they're not going to do it any bank a favor. So right. they were offering zero, zero interest if the bank was, if Warburg's were, were long. But if Warburgs were overdrawn, the, the interest was somewhat punitive. So you didn't want to be overdrawn, but you didn't want to keep it too long. And what, and what was causing money to go into, that, uh, into and out of that account were the buys and sells of US instruments that Warburg were doing at the time. So if they, if they, if they bought uh, 100 shares at a dollar each, you know, that would be $100 that would leave the account. So it was going to be overdrawn by a hundred, but conversely, if they were buying, if they were selling two hundred dollars worth of shares, then it would be two hundred dollars long. And uh, at that time, they would they were doing a few hundred thousand, sort of half a million or so transactions per day, so half a million movements into and out of that bank account. And our first challenge was just to tell them tomorrow what will be your balance or, or actually the, uh, at that time the trading cycle i think was t plus three so not tomorrow but in three days time what do i predict the balance to be given all of the movements that will take place between now and t plus three and, and enable warburg to then move money into the account if they were going to be short or if they were going to be long, then to put that money into some kind of depository instrument, which was earning interest. And that was the kind of challenge that we were set at that time. And what it turns out, it's, it's quite an interesting challenge because not every single transaction settles. And when it fails to settle, of course, if you funded that transaction, if you've moved money into an account to fund it, or you've moved money out of the account because it's going to be delivering money, if you if you've done that, and the trade doesn't actually happen the way that you think it's going to happen, your funding calculation is wrong, and we found that very often our funding calculation was wrong, and it was causing the bank to lose money either by paying punitive interest or actually lose money because they weren't they weren't making the most of the money that they got that was long in the account. And we put into Warburg, which by then had gone through a, a number of acquisitions, but was by then I think Swiss Bank. We put into Swiss Bank one of the their very first neural networks where we were looking at every transaction that was at, that was due to settle, that was being done today or yesterday or the day before that was due to settle 
over the next three days. And with that neural network, make an assessment of whether it's likely to settle, given the history of trades that were like that. So a, a classic example is um, at that time in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the late 1990s, Italian bonds had got a terrible record of settlement. And so if Warburg were, or West, Swiss Bank were trading an Italian bond, then the chances of, of, of it actually settling were, were you know, something like 20% for, for, for many of those instruments. So you could make an assessment if you did enough of them to only fund 20% or other, other rules that could, be, that could be injected into the neural network to, to, to make sense of that data. We had a highly successful project, so which in fact, it was the bank's most um, successful project that year. And... I was actually awarded a, a, a Swiss bank holiday at that time to Silicon Valley. So I was, I was given uh, a bunch of Swiss bank business cards. I was flown over to San Francisco and I was told to spend three months in the Valley wow. looking at various interesting um, companies that were out there. So I, I met with Next, for example. Um, I, uh, I, I, I can't claim I was, uh, that I introduced Java to, to, to Swiss bank. But I was one of the proponents of Java at, at, at Swiss, given everything I'd learned on that um, holiday, and um, actually got involved in the web for the very first time, and moved from Silicon Valley to Swiss Bank in New York, and helped them build their very first website based on the technologies that um, I'd learned about on that on that three months holiday. So. A really interesting uh, part of my career, on um, you know an early foray into neural networks and, and what we would call AI these days, and a, a very very early foray. In fact, I think um, I actually requested that the SBC domain domain name was created at that time. So that um, and I, and I, at that time I, I I was barely familiar with what what that really meant and how domains actually worked. But that that's a a potted history of some of my, my some of my career in finance. Very cool. So, how did you get to Gresham, and what exactly do you guys do? Yeah, how did I get to Gresham? So, um, after that neural network work, I really f- felt, and, and the team I was working with felt that there was the possibility to create some kind of product there. It couldn't be the case that the work that we'd done at Swiss Bank was unique to Swiss Bank. And so sure. I left and ultimately um, formed with a, a group of colleagues, a, a, a startup a company called Pace Metrics, to actually productize that work and, and, and um, try to sell it to the other banks and um, actually we had some, we had our successes but ultimately um, the data confounded us that we we didn't have as many successes as, as we liked and I was I was persuaded actually to to join a company called Smartstream working in a very very similar space uh, Smartstream were focusing on reconciliation. Okay. So reconciliation is this activity of when, once a trade has settled and the money has entered a bank account or has left the bank account, you need to know that the right money has entered or the right money is left. And you compare the entries on your bank statement with, with the entries in your general ledger. And that is challenging partly because of the volume. You know, the, the, there can be uh, these days on, on, a, on a big US dollar account, there could be 20 million entries on, on that per day or, or more. Um, so the, the volume in itself is challenging. But also you end up with these one-to-many relationships. So the bank pays out $100 million, but it does that in 10 lots of 10 million. So you've got 100 million on one side and you've got 10 lots of 10 million on the other. Or you end up with these many-to-many relationships. So, so many transactions on one side matching to many transactions on the other. Banks are remarkably good at throwing away important data you know if you if you're matching 
what you think should be in your bank statement against what your general ledger has, one of the most important things is the reference number. And most banks are really poor at maintaining that reference number through their through their infrastructure. So SmartStream and other vendors um, made money from productizing that check, that final check of is all the money I expected to move, has it moved? And all of the instruments that I've traded, have they all ended up being traded? Have, have all of my positions been updated correctly? It's an important check. It's a regulated check. It has, has to happen every single day. And there is an expectation from the regulator that you will do that check. So whilst it's not formally demanded, the, the regulators will be unhappy if you're not doing that, that, that check every day. And you're, you're measured as a vendor in that space, you're measured on how good your match rates are. And the match rates need to be super, you know, supremely high. You need to be at the 99.9999. You, know, you need to get to six nines of match rate. Otherwise, the manual effort that's involved is huge. Nonetheless, no matter how good your matching engine is, you will find that there are problems. You will find that things that you expected to happen, just like those Italian trades I referred to earlier, things that you expected to happen didn't actually happen. And humans need to get involved and, and look at those problems. And towards the end of my tenure at SmartStream, I did a survey of the SmartStream customers and I was hearing quite unanimously that they were really happy with the, the software that we delivered to them, that we were doing the reconciliations well, our match rates were acceptable, we were finding problems, uh, we, we were highlighting problems to them. But one of the things that was disappointing that, to them was that the problem had happened on trade date and they only knew about it on settlement date plus one. So they do a trade today, Tuesday, it settles on Thursday, and on Friday you find out there's a problem. But in reality, that problem occurred much earlier in the life cycle. And cutting a long story short, uh, <laughs> conscious that I've already delivered a long story, cutting a long story short-ish, um, I felt that that identification of trading problems earlier in the life cycle was a repeatable problem that people would be willing to invest money in solving. Because if you can fix problems on trade date, not settlement date plus one, you, you lower the cost of fixing, you lower your operational risk, you lower your reputational risk. And if we built the right product to identify what are essentially data problems early, early in the life cycle of a transaction, then that would that would that there would be a market, and I actually did a pitch to the Gresham board some thirteen years ago, giving them a, a, a story similar to the one I've just given you. Really taking them through what happens in trading, where the problems are, why the problems aren't identified on trade date, because the the systems to identify the problems are not good enough, and explaining to the Gresham board that if we built the right products, there was a market to be had, a market that now is referred to as data quality, data certainty, data confidence, and a market where we've now gone to, grown from zero customers in 2010 to having 300 customers that use our software wow. to give them confidence that the data that they're operating over is correct or an, and where it isn't correct, that they know about it as early as possible in the life cycle of a transaction so that they can get that transaction repaired and back into the straight through processing path as quickly as possible. Along the way, we uh, have, have acquired a number of companies to, to help us in deliver parts of the solution. So um, a lot of what we've ended up doing is around banks connecting to corporates and delivering data to their corporate customers. And we've been involved in that connectivity and we acquired uh, a Luxembourgish company that 
to help us do that. Um, we were in our early days dealing with lots and lots of non-standard data, unusual formats, bespoke formats, formats that were um, unique to that bank or unique to that bank's geography or unique to their London office or unique to their equity trading. There were We were dealing with very messy, uh, somewhat complex, poorly understood data. And we proved to our customers that we could make sense of that data and give them certainty over that data and understanding over that data. And they then, many of our customers then set us the challenge of understanding their more standard data, understanding their SWIFT messages, for example, understanding their FPML messages, understanding their fixed messages. Does all the data that's in a more standard format also make sense and we acquired a company to help us parse more standard messages acquired a company called c24 and have incorporated that into our portfolio and as we've proven that we can understand problems on trade date and t plus one organizations then have asked us to start to do their reconciliations as well so the the work that i had done at smartstream we've extended our product portfolio to deal with reconciliation as well. So we deal with data quality issues on T and T plus one and reconciliation issues on settlement date and settlement date plus one. And we do the whole gamut now of post-trade certainty and post-trade um, understanding of, 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 of the, of the settlement cycle. And, and, um, part of our industry, as you may be aware, um, we, we split our industry very broadly into the buy side and the sell side. So the, 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 the buy side are holding on to instruments for much longer and have, in many ways, a more extensive set of requirements. And two, yeah, about two years ago, we acquired a US company, Electra, Electra Information Systems, who have some specialized technology for the reconciliation of the buy side. And we've been busy over the last two years incorporating that into our product portfolio. So 300 customers, many acquired organically, but also many acquired through acquisition. And we've built a portfolio through of capabilities through those acquisitions and organic growth. When I did my pitch to the Gresham board, I said that I would need 12 developers to develop the solution. Okay. It's somewhat embarrassed to say at this point we have 80, 80 developers working uh, w- within development um, on all aspects of data quality and reconciliation and indeed connectivity, connecting banks to their corporates, but connecting banks to their trading venues. So that's, that's um, in, a, <laughs> I'd say in a nutshell, but a very big nutshell, uh, what, uh, what Gresham do. Okay, very cool. So how are you leveraging AI in all the technology that you just talked about? And how does it basically help with everything you've talked about so far? Uh, Well, that's a good question, isn't it? How does it help? So we we deal with a lot of complexity. And from the very, from our very earliest kind of customers, in fact, customer number two, we started to develop some degree of AI and machine learning around trying to tame some of that complexity, trying to understand that complexity, trying to, from data alone, understand the business rules. Because we knew that the when you, when you check to see if you've got a problem, you're really executing a business rule. Right. And... There are many, many business rules to be built. Many, and if you leave that entirely to manual effort, that that will take you a long time. So we invested in 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 those early days in understanding from the data alone what the business rules might be, and that's been very successful for us, and and very successful for our customers. Uh, less successful for our PS folk because it reduces the amount of effort that required to configure our system. But nonetheless, you know, a, a, a good piece of AI tech 
that given the data that the organization is processing uh, produces a rule set of how that of of whether that data is correct or not from the data alone so a, a big leg up in terms of configuring our system we are doing a number of proof of concepts now around whether given that you given that something has gone wrong there are a number of things that have to happen with that data so it's gone wrong who in the organization is responsible for fixing it and we think and and we're doing proof of concepts that look very promising that the assignment of a problem the the assignment of a break to a person or a part of the organization seems to lend itself to 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 ai having assigned it to the right group we've also been looking at whether it makes sense to try and guide the human as to what the root cause might be what are the what are the paths of investigation so at a very very minimum can we suggest how they should fix this problem and in, in indeed we we see this developing into saying not just propose a fix but in some cases we we, we will have sufficient confidence in the ai to 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 resolve the issue we also see that when people are confronted with problems they often try to make sense of the of the wider data set and they start to ask queries of that data set so if they've got a problem with an equity swap they might ask a question of show me all of the equity swaps that were traded yesterday with this counterparty or in this location that were over a certain value or um, were, were, were with a certain risk profile so they start to construct quite complex questions to ask of that data and what we found is that those questions are sufficiently complex that the human sometimes has difficulty constructing the right question and they refine and refine and refine and we've done some again proof of concept work but again really promising where we get the human to suggest or to ask the question in natural language and give feeding that natural language into a large language model uh, the a large language model that knows about our data model and can convert a, a quite natural language question into a complex more algebraic expression for our query language and again we're finding success there and i, I look forward to being able to embed that in our product so that people when they're asking these complicated questions can ask them in english or french or german or you know can ask them in a natural language rather than having to have a more formulaic way of uh, of, of 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 entering the question interesting i've, talk, I've Go, talked a little bit, yeah i've talked a little bit about the configuration of our software and uh, the AI has always been there to help with that configuration. Uh, we're we're experimenting with ways of co again configuring our software through la natural language. So we we have loaded out all of our configuration language again into a large language model, and we can now start to ask questions of how should I configure Clarity Control our software? How should I configure Control? to answer this, to deliver me this kind of um, financial control, to deliver me this kind of check. And we're finding that, again, with promise, that the AI can, through a conversational kind of interface, construct configuration or help a human construct configuration much more quickly than that human can do alone even though we've had a, a degree of ai in the product for quite some time the addition of that large language model into into what we do can can significantly simplify the configurer's task so lots and lots of promise with large language models in 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 our software and again looking forward to taking lots of proof of concepts 
of making those into real code. And that, that's what, that'll be our development challenge over the next 12 months to turn what looked to be really promising ideas into executable, repeatable business that, that, that's embedded into our code. One, uh, there are probably many words of caution here. <laughs> one, one of which is, I think, I think this has been quite well documented and the LLMs don't always get it right. Yeah. And we, see, we, we sometimes see really bizarre, so really bizarre expressions. So you ask a question, and you expect the LLM to be able to easily formulate the right kind of question to, a, to, a, to our product. And it asks completely the wrong question. So there are challenges there. So when, when it gets it wrong, how, how do you even identify that it's got it wrong? And how do you apologize? You know, what, what, is the, what is the back and forth that you have with the user? Because their question was completely sensible, but the, but the LLM failed, you know, it, it hallucinated. It failed to make sense of it and answered a completely different question. So there are challenges that we face, but I think they're, they're, they're well-known challenges that the whole of the industry faces. Right. But it, it, also, it sounds like you're building tools to basically help humans and do some of the more, some of the more maybe time consuming tasks, maybe some of the more challenging tasks, but you're basically building technology to really help people not necessarily wipe out their job completely. Or, or what is your thoughts around kind of the doom and gloom pros and cons of kind of AI? Well, I, I, I think, you know, somewhat sadly, it is, it is inevitable that we will save a significant amount of time in the back office. And indeed, with some automated resolutions, you could you could imagine that some elements of a job and, and, and possibly a person's entire role could be could be automated away. So I, I am part of that doom and gloom in terms of the future of jobs. I, I, I'd also observe and I think we've seen this happen already with RPA, with 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 robots. Um, that the knowledge of an organisation, the knowledge of why something is done, is in danger of being lost. And the AI is all well and good, but it no longer there's no longer an explanation as to why things happen the way they should happen. And I do have a fear that um, we're making our organizations quite brittle. It's the humans in the organization that are malleable and the humans that can react to when something completely different happens. It's the humans that can understand that well and figure out, at, le at least observe that it's very different and start, start the process of understanding what, why is this so different. And I worry, and I've seen I've seen RPAs just break and, and make an organisation resistant to change. And if there's one thing that certainly the City of London has been really successful at is innovation, is actually delivering change that has had, I think, enormous benefits for society in terms of the wealth that we've created that that for the in in the city and in, and in finance that ultimately is good for the for the UK and the and the global population and that innovation requires that malleability it requires the organization to be able to respond to change quickly efficiently effectively and to manage the risk of that change very very well and i i've got a doom and gloom about ai uh, removing jobs but i've also got a doom and gloom about when the ai can't respond to change but there are no humans left do we become brittle do we become less innovative do we start to fear innovation is it is it our, and is that innovation that's really important to 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 all of us ultimately we want we want innovation we want it to be controlled we want the risk to be managed around that innovation but we do want innovation and and so uh, just a little bit of a fear there a bit of doom and gloom there kevin interesting so i i guess what are your thoughts and advice for actually building some of these technologies into the financial sector because well 
banks traditionally aren't known to be kind of the most um, innovative in technology, but I think a lot of the stuff that you've talked about today, they basically have to adapt because, or adopt, sorry, because it, it just, it makes sense, right? Like it saves them a ton of time. It can catch a lot of errors. It just speeds everything up, right? And especially as things just, like we're so well connected now. Uh, I suppose the the positive there is, uh, and I, I do agree actually that they're, they're, they can be, particularly in the back office, the banks can be quite laggards, some way behind where um, organization where you expect people to be. So, for example, there isn't a single one of our customers that doesn't move files around. You know, they they should be taking advantage of modern messaging solutions like Kafka and queues, but they don't, they move files. So the, so you're absolutely right. There has been a lack of, of investment and, and, and actually a lack of adoption of, of good tech in, in the middle and back office. Nonetheless, I have to say, uh, there's not a single RFP that we receive. There's not a single sales meeting that I'm involved with that doesn't have AI and ML as a as a as an important part of that sales process, right. as an important part of their RFP. So, I I have to say that 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 it's it's not it's definitely not being ignored. I slightly worry on this aspect that it that it, it may be seen as a silver bullet. Banks have built up a lot of complexity where they didn't need it, or where if you were starting from greenfield, you wouldn't have that complexity there. And I think it's it's seen to be to some degree a silver bullet to all of the problems that that complexity is delivering, and I'm 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 not sure it's there. And I I I know that you know what we're doing and what what other organisations are doing. They have they have been there are successes to be had. I mean, undoubtedly, lots and lots of successes to be had. But it is not the universal panacea. There are other things that organizations need to do to simplify their infrastructure. Yeah. And I guess you could use AI to help with some of that, but replace it all. Yeah. To your point, like you need human beings around if something goes totally sideways or change. Yeah. That's a, yeah. I think it's, you know, it's, it, it goes sideways because errors just happen, but it goes yeah. sideways because the business needs change, the, the front office trading strategies change. What they need to do to deliver to the top line requires a difference in in in, the, in processing. And if you're not, if you haven't got humans in that mix, that difference is going to cause you enormous problems. Yeah, that's actually really good advice. So you, you've mentioned you've acquired a bunch of companies. Obviously, you've been innovating inside of Grisham for a long time now. What advice do you give to people that are, you know, maybe building startups or thinking about building startups in um, the fintech uh, kind of banking space? My number one advice for any startup, I think, actually, is, is really work hard. And I think it is hard work, actually to keep your focus and it's really easy to chase the next dollar and, 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 and lose your focus. And just so my strong advice would be you know, know what you do well, focus on what you do well, deliver that before you allow yourself to get pulled off in other directions. It's far too easy to, to, to chase the dollar and get, move away from your focus point and and that 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 can inevit it will inevitably ultimately mean that you dilute the value that you expect it to deliver so keep your focus absolutely keep your focus second thing i, I know you asked for one thing maybe uh, but no, the second fine. thing i do is actually i think it's really really important you need to have conversations with your customers you need yeah. to be talking to your customers you really need to understand what they're saying. And, and you know, sometimes those are going to be painful conversations because they're not going to like, you know, you, you, they're going to be giving you a bit of a kick up the backside. Um, at other times, they'll be annoying because you'll be thinking, you know, they're asking for a, that blue button to be green or that green button to be turquoise. And you're thinking, 
why am why am I spending time hearing such minor minor detail? I want the next transformative thing, but unless you have unless you have those conversations, you won't you won't hear the transformative thing. So get involved with your customers. Be talking to your customers. Be listening. Be understanding what their problems are because. That's where you'll hear about the next big thing. That's where you'll. That's where you'll hear. You know, ultimately, you're going to be looking for that that common problem, that ubiquitous problem, that problem that's got some degree of urgency, that problem that customers are going to be willing to spend money to deliver. And if you can if you can capture all three of those in those conversations with those customers, then you're going to. I think you're on the on the road to being successful as long as you keep that focus. So those, that'd be my number one and number two. Keep your focus. Talk to your customers. Talk to your prospects. Never stop talking to them. Uh, no, I, I think that's really good advice. But then, how do you manage your internal roadmap or focus compared to maybe some of those re- feature requests? Because that can be challenging <laughs> in itself. The the innovators' dilemma. Yeah, of, that's right. You know, yeah, uh, it, and it is. And there's there's no easy answer. Is so you you've got to be looking for tomorrow whilst keeping the lights on today and you've got to do you've absolutely got to do both of, of those activities one one of the things i i would encourage is that you do 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 try to be as small a company as possible try to keep your processes as minimal as process as 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 possible of course the more successful you get the more likely you are to inject processes in Sure. Um, but you need to be agile. You need to be agile for delivering to tomorrow. You you need to be somewhat agile for to deliver for today. And it's really important that you keep an eye on those processes. Don't let them get too heavyweight. Don't let them slow you down because the bigger you get, the more people you have in your organization, the easier it will be to become process heavy and you take your eye off tomorrow. And actually, you fail to deliver for today as well. So you, 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 you're you failing on both those aspects. It's really easy to do. Just be careful not to do it. Keep yourself lean and agile. Focus. Do, do have some percentage of your budget focused on tomorrow. But keep your customers happy today as well. Not rocket science, I'm afraid. Fair enough. I, I think that's actually really good advice. But we're kind of coming to the end of the show. So how about we close with mentioning where people can get more information about Grisham Tech and any other links you want to mention? Uh, The website, uh, www.greshamtech.com. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find Gresham Tech on LinkedIn. Find find all of the senior team on LinkedIn. And of course, uh, listening to this podcast. Hopefully you've picked up more information about Gresham as well. Perfect, Neil. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day. Kevin, thank you. It's been delightful. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.